There's a great deal to share with everyone these days, but let me start with a question. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers? After we confess our faith, this is the first question we affirm in the baptismal covenant. As you know, for us who express our Christian faith within the Episcopal Church and Anglicanism itself, the covenant serves more than simply our liturgy for celebrating baptism. The baptismal covenant celebrates who we are and strive to be even more as we follow Jesus. It is not just an idea or set of principles, but how we are formed and even reformed as the body of Christ in this church. In these recent days, it may have felt more than a little difficult to practice our faith when we aren't physically together, when our common prayer is practiced simply in our homes, or when we are experiencing worship on YouTube. The fact remains, however, that we have been living into the apostles' teaching, fellowship, and prayers, even if we have not been able to gather around our common table for the Eucharist itself. This has been a time to practice pastoral care with one another in new as well as familiar ways. The power of intercessory prayer, our fellowship in calls, notes, and even with FaceTime or Zoom has been felt and appreciated by each of us and all of us as a single community. Recent weeks have been a time to also reflect more deeply on the other four questions asked in the baptismal covenant. How we live our faith in the world and for our neighbor. Together, these five questions form the modern notion of what has been asked of Anglican Christians since 1662. Wilt thou obediently keep God's holy will and commandments? The answer remains timeless. I will with God's help. Community life, a resistance to evil, and a desire to return to the Lord compel us to seek a life of witness to the gospel in terms of who we are and what we do in as much as what we say, building and at times reforming a life of service to seek Jesus in all persons, which calls us even beyond ourselves toward justice, peace, respecting the dignity of every human being. The Christian notion of justice is far beyond what is fair or balanced by the world's standards. It bids us to ask, what does my neighbor need in order to live a right life with God? God's holy will and the two great commandments. I share all this with you not only to address the stress and tension of our times, but even more to affirm the basis by which we are seeking to reopen, to rebuild, and to reform ourselves around our common table in the weeks and months ahead. While we are all anxious to return to our regular parish life, we recognize that we must do so carefully and in coordination with local authorities and our diocese. This is part of what it means to live into our baptismal covenant, to care and support one another, especially our most vulnerable individuals. There are and probably will be still more things that we are allowed to do by some regulatory standards and even more things that our neighbors may choose to do themselves. Yet what we need to do takes more prayerful consideration. For some, it will feel like we're moving too slow. Others aren't ready for the steps to take at this time. It's simply too soon. I and your vestry appreciate the difference. So does our bishop, and the guidelines we are called to follow, therefore, are not to just consider federal and state directives, but also what we must follow as a diocese. Our baptismal covenant calls us, even as we take further steps to reopen, to constantly consider what is necessary for the health, safety, and accessibility of people. Therefore, what the needs of individuals and families are, so that we can work to fulfill our mission, our mission of St. Thomas, to make God's love known by who we are, what we practice, and how we serve others in Christ's name. That hasn't changed. We are now in a time of planning and preparation, preparing the building physically, but more importantly, beginning to prepare our people, whether with new practices, supplies, protocols, or even programs as they roll out. This is time we must keep asking ourselves, are we prepared? This includes 
returning to a more public presence in the community, beginning with public worship, intensifying our cleaning and maintenance protocols even more, establishing new standards for capacity, including the length of time in, in a space, precautions and safety measures, how best to practice contact tracing and other health measures, how best to emphasize individual practices that we can share, the health and safety of all, through hand washing, yes, but even more, temperature screening, the use of face masks, and arrangement of seating with physical distance measures. All this includes training of new procedures and ongoing communications in the weeks ahead. As we look ahead to July, we hope and anticipate moving into the next part of our own recovery. This would begin July 6 and take us through the rest of the summer months of July and August. It is safe to say that all of our planning and preparation is based on the presumption that we continue to make progress in the overall health and recovery of our greater community. If we experience a setback, we will need to respond appropriately and return to a greater amount of precautions and protective measures. While the primary work in these past months of the health crisis has fallen to our staff and leaders, there is great work ahead to be shared, both collectively and as individuals as volunteers. Some of this work will be familiar, but a lot has changed. No doubt we'll be learning more in the weeks and months ahead. For now, even the way we can greet each other before and after the service needs to be different. For this, we are, asked, we are looking for more volunteers to be greeters and ushers. Help us welcome people safely. Anticipating the week of July 6, the next part of our own reopening plan would build from what we have established, adding more basic elements of our ministry into place, such as modified public worship on Sunday mornings and Tuesday evenings. Small group meetings and more staff on site would begin all with a high amount of protective measures and restrictions as set forth by the diocese and following other regulatory guidelines and best practices. This would mean that anticipating beginning July 7th, a Tuesday evening prayer service would be at 615. Anticipating beginning the following Sunday on July 12th, St. Thomas would resume public worship with two Sunday services of the Word, 8 a.m. Rite 1 and 1015 with Rite 2. Our in-person worship will be in addition to what we continue to offer online through our YouTube channel. Our worship will be designed within the guidelines we have received, so each gathering would be 45 minutes and be a modified version of the service of the Word, the first half of the Eucharist service, without Holy Communion at this time. The protective measures we will follow at this time will further restrict what we are able to do, and when, where, and how many may gather, and for how long? I need to stress that this is not the new normal, as the only thing that has seemed normative in recent months has been change itself. These measures do mark progress we are able to make. We are all adapting. We are growing as we continue to live into our baptismal covenant together. There will be more to share. Information will not only post on the website, but also communicate through the mail. Until then, remember there are things we can all do to help, starting with our own health and safety. It's not just good manners to keep washing your hands, it's now our practice, as are wearing face masks and continuing physical distance. Let's do our part in united fashion. Please stay well, stay connected, and may God's peace and blessings be with you and your whole family. Thank you.